Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to the 66th live webinar on orthopedic principles. And good morning to all those who are watching it from the United States. Today, we have guest of honor, Dr. Savya Sachi, or simply called Savya Tucker, from John Hopkins, Baltimore, United States. Dr. Tucker is a hip and knee reconstructive surgeon serving patients in Baltimore, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. metro areas. His expertise is mainly on minimally invasive hip and knee surgery, including partial and total hip and knee replacements, outpatient joint replacement, and complex revisions after previous joint replacement surgery. Dr. Tucker uses computer and robotic assisted techniques for these procedures to provide cutting edge care to patients with hip and knee arthritis. Currently, he serves as Assistant Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at John Hopkins. Dr. Tucker completed his medical degree at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine and stayed for his residency again at the John Hopkins. He was the first recipient of the Donald P. Young Leadership Award as Chief Resident. He continued his training as a knee arthritis and traumatology fellow in Switzerland, followed by an adult reconstruction fellowship in New York. He then pursued the prestigious European New Society Traveling Fellowship, focusing on advanced surgical techniques and management of arthritis. Dr. Ducker's research interests include technological advances in the treatment of arthritis, post-traumatic arthritis, the economic impact of arthritis, and the optimization of hospital protocols for arthritis management. He's also interested in exploring same-day joint replacement surgeons, maximize time in hospital and maximize return to function. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Savya Sachi Tucker. Over to you, Dr. Tucker. Thank you very much, Dr. Gopalan, for including me in this uh, dynamic lecture series, which, uh, and we're gonna talk this morning, uh, in morning in Washington, DC, but uh, evening in India. So good evening to everyone who's joining us in India on the spine pelvis relationship, especially from the perspective of a hip surgeon. Um, and this is, a, this is a fairly complex topic that's gaining a lot of traction. And I was hoping that we could cover some basic principles. Uh, I have no relevant disclosures for this talk, but this is our beautiful hospital in Baltimore, uh, the Johns Hopkins Hospital. And I'm very privileged to be a part of the orthopedics department there. And I welcome whoever would like to come and visit us. So, you know, when we think about the spine and pelvis relationship, we have to kind of go to the proverbial chicken and the egg. What came first? Was it the chicken or the egg or vice versa? And I invite you to think about a paradigm shift. We really have to think about the egg as a boneless chicken. So we have to combine these principles to really understand how the spine affects the pelvis and vice versa. And we have to work together with our spine surgery colleagues sometimes to appropriately place implants in these patients to prevent complications. And I'll go over some of these complications in some of my later slides. The sacro-pelvis junction is a very complex junction because it's the link between the axial skeleton, which is the spine, and then the appendicular skeleton, which is the pelvis and the lower extremities. So changes in one frequently affect the other. And it's a very dynamic relationship as highlighted by this video, uh, which was developed in Lyon, France. So in this, uh, you know, you can see that the sacrum will be attached to the spinal column, as you can see here. And the spinal column is a very mobile unit uh, with multiple joints uh, across the spectrum. There is a sacral slope, which then defines where the spine and pelvis lie. Uh, and as the sacrum moves in this sagittal plane uh, video, you can see how the spinal curvatures are changing. Now switching to the coronal view, as the sacrum moves side to side, once again, the spinal curves have to compensate for the sacrum. The sacrum, fortunately or unfortunately, is attached to the pelvis. So now as the pelvis moves side to side, again, the spinal columns have to adjust in a compensatory fashion and this relationship also exists in the sagittal plane. So this is a complex three-dimensional relationship uh, in terms of spinosagittal and spinopelvic balance. So today what we're going to do is we are going to look at some spinopelvic measurements 
I will start by defining these measurements with regards to a spine surgeon, and then I'll take it with regards to a total hip surgeon because we have similar nomenclature, but we look at this from two different perspectives. So it's like two sides of a coin. Then we will define what exactly is the meaning of acetabular antiversion as it means to the spine surgeon and as it means to the total hip surgeon. Then we will look at some examples of sagittal spinal balance and imbalance. And finally, we will discuss the implications for total hip, and I will demonstrate three cases uh, to go over some of these principles. So these are the three critical spinal pelvic measurements that we all need to understand. And most of the times, these are used by spine surgeons to define balance or imbalance. But even as hip surgeons, we should at least understand the basic principles. The first one is a sacral slope. Then we have the pelvic tilt and the pelvic incidence. The pelvic incidence from amongst these is constant. And any changes that happen keep the pelvic incidence constant, but changes will be in the sacral slope and the pelvic tilt. So let's define these. The sacral slope is defined as a line drawn from the top of the sacrum along and an, uh, a line drawn horizontal. And the angle that is formed by these two lines is defined as the sacral slope. And this is where the sacrum meets the lumbar spine and defines that junction. Pelvic tilt is defined by a line drawn vertically north or vertically towards the head from the center of the femoral head in the sagittal plane. And another line drawn from the center of the femoral head to the center of the top of the sacrum, uh, the sacrum, the proximal aspect of the sacrum. And that angle is known as the pelvic tilt. Finally, pelvic incidence is a line drawn from the center of the femoral head in the sagittal plane to the center of the proximal aspect of the sacrum and another line drawn along the sacral body. So this value is what remains constant. Now, if you look at this, the pelvic incidence, once again, I'm going to draw it out for you. It's the line down the body of the sacrum and connecting it to the femoral head at, from the center of the sacrum. The pelvic tilt, as you can see here, is the line connected by the center of the sacrum to the center of the femoral head, and then one drawn vertically north towards the head. And finally, the sacral slope is a horizontal line to the slope of the proximal aspect of the sacrum. As you can see, the relationship of this is that the pelvic incidence equals to the pelvic tilt plus the sacral slope. So it's the sum of the pelvic tilt plus the sacral slope. Pelvic incidence averages about 50 degrees. So the range is from about 48 to 53 degrees and it's fixed in adults. In children, it's still moving, but in adults, it's fixed. So any kind of compensatory movements have to happen by alterations in sacral slope and pelvic tilt. But we don't really understand these when we're doing a total hip. So let's define this further. Now, what is the relationship between the spine and pelvis and what's considered balanced and unbalanced? So Schwab looked at this and published this in 2013. For this, we have to measure the Cobb angle for lumbar lordosis. So you take L1 and you take L5 and you draw lines along the superior aspect of L1 and the inferior aspect of L5, and then you draw perpendicular lines. And the angle that is connected by these, or, or is made by these perpendicular lines is called lumbar lordosis. So ideally, the lumbar lordosis should be within 10 degrees uh, of the pelvic incidence. So the ideal sacral, uh, ideal sagittal balance is when you have a pelvic tilt that's lower than 22 degrees and the mismatch between the pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis is less than 10 or 11 degrees. So that's when you know that the spine is well balanced. And this is an example of spinal pelvic mismatch where the lumbar lordosis in this case is uh, approximately 22 degrees by the Cobb angle uh, technique. And the pelvic incidence is shown to be 65 degrees. So there is a greater than uh, 10 degree mismatch. And this is typical of a flat back syndrome where adequate lumbar lordosis has not been restored in the fusion construct for this patient. Now, those were the spine terms, but we have to really look at terms for the acetabulum and terms for the pelvis. So now let's switch our roles from spine surgeons to hip surgeons, and we have to look at acetabular antiversion. Acetabular antiversion can be defined in several different planes, and, and I have 
um, you know, a pelvis model with an acetabulum fixed into it. So if you're doing a posterior or lateral approach, which I tend to use for a lot of my cases, you look at acetabular antiversion in the sagittal plane, especially when you position a patient and when you see what is the opening angle of the cup. If you look at a radiograph to assess how much antiversion you have, you will look at it in a coronal plane by holding the pelvis like this. If you are going to assess failure of acetabular components and see whether or not there was enough antiversion, you will get a cross stable lateral x-ray for these patients to see whether acetabular antiversion was restored, or you will get a transverse plane CT scan uh, or, a, or a cross sectional CT scan and you'll see where does the cup point? Does it point towards the head or towards the ceiling, which is antiverted, or does it point towards the floor, which means retroversion? So for the purposes of this talk, uh, we are really going to focus on sagittal spinal issues and sagittal spinal balance, and that will be defined as our operative acetabular antiversion. So how do we measure that? We will draw a line from the posterior inferior aspect of the acetabulum parallel to the floor. So that's your horizontal reference. And then we draw another line connecting the posterior inferior aspect of the acetabulum to the anterior superior aspect of the acetabulum, and that's defined as acetabular antiversion. And you can see that is pointed towards the front. Now, these are examples of what happens when you go from a standing position shown on the left to a sitting position shown on the right. So notice in both these figures, what's key to notice is that the pelvic incidence remains absolutely the same. Look at the sacral slope from the standing position to the sitting position, the sacral slope decreases. So if the pelvic incidence has to remain constant, what has to happen is that the pelvic tilt has to increase from the standing position to the sitting position. Along with an increase in the pelvic tilt, there is also an increase in the acetabular antiversion. Now this is a case of a normal person who doesn't have any spinal pathology or a prior spinal fusion. So this is a flexible spinopelvic unit. And to illustrate this with this model, if you're in a standing position, that's how the pelvis appears. And in a sitting position, that's what happens. If you want to look at it in terms of the acetabulum that I have fixed, in a standing position, your acetabular component is somewhat like this. In a sitting position, the acetabular component appears to be more antiverted and more vertical. So let's look at, that was pelvic um, uh, changes from the standing to the sitting position. What about pelvic version? Pelvic antiversion and retroversion is a little bit different than acetabular antiversion and retroversion. And I have a, a wonderful video, again shot at Leon, showing this. So tilting the pelvis forward as if to give an inlet view of the pelvis is known as pelvic antiversion. Okay, now let's, I'm just focusing on the pelvis in this slide, uh, even though there are some compensatory changes in the spine on how the spine is stressed. If the pelvis is moved backwards posteriorly so that it gives an outlet view of the pelvis on an X-ray, on an AP pelvis X-ray, that is known as pelvic retroversion. So once again, I'm gonna demonstrate this with my pelvic model. So if I'm looking at a pelvis straight on in a coronal plane, this is called pelvic antiversion, an inlet view of the pelvis, and this is called pelvic retroversion, okay? But notice what happens in the sagittal plane as I do that. So in a sagittal plane, I'm holding the pelvis in pelvic antiversion. You can see inside the pelvis. Look at the acetabular component. The acetabular component actually appears to be, if you look at an AP view, it appears to be very neutral or retroverted. So the acetabulum is retroverted. Now, if the pelvis goes into retroversion, so that's an outlet view as seen here, look at how much opening you see in the acetabulum. So now the acetabular antiversion is exaggerated. So how do you define this paradoxical relationship? And this is a simple slide to conceptualize it. As you are standing, so this is your pelvis model again, as you are standing, if you have normal lordosis, you tend to have pelvic antiversion. And with pelvic antiversion, the acetabular antiversion is reduced. So there is relative retroversion of the acetabulum in relation to the pelvis. As you sit down, 
your pelvis goes into retroversion. So you have an outlet view of the pelvis, but the acetabular antiversion and verticality increase. So it's a paradoxical relationship between the pelvis and the acetabulum. And that is key to understand spinopelvic balance. So where do you put the cup? And this is a video, again, kind of demonstrating standing to sitting position. As you go from standing to sitting, the acetabular antiversion, as we discovered in the previous slides, increases. The average increase in a normal patient is about 15 or 16 degrees. Along with this, you have to understand that the cup verticality also increases by about 20 or 25 degrees. And this is very important as you are placing acetabular components. If you place an acetabular component appropriately antiverted, your cup is going to be slightly vertical. And as you over antivert this in some of these cases, you have to be careful that you do not make your cup too vertical. That is just the three dimensional nature of the acetabulum. So the corollary to that is that if you are placing your acetabular component in retroversion, the acetabular component will be a lot more horizontal. So just be aware of this as you perform your total hip cases and pay attention to this three-dimensional relationship. Now, pelvic, you know, when you use these sagittal plane references that we define, which is the sacral slope, uh, pelvic tilt, pelvic incidence, lumbar lordosis, what is important to realize is that as you do a total hip, you know, really the pelvic tilt does not change. The sacral slope does not change. The pelvic incidence does not change. What changes is the position of the patient when they go from a standing to a sitting position. So the pelvic tilt and the pelvic incidence and sacral slope will remain the same as you're doing a total hip, but what changes are these parameters as the patient mobilizes. So a safe zone that has been determined, a Lewenic safe zone is about five to 25 degrees of antiversion. And if you are doing the Ranawat combined antiversion technique, you should have about between 30 degrees to 50 degrees of combined antiversion. And you know, the concept of combined antiversion is very confusing. So I have a, I have a slide uh, showing you this, and this is from Ranawat's uh, publication. What you do is that with the leg in a neutral position from posterior lateral approach, you line up the flat part of the trial head with the flat part of the polyethylene. So you make them parallel or coplanar with the leg in the neutral position. Now, the second thing you do is that you look at the angle made between the leg. So that's between the tibia, tibia and the floor. And that angle should be anywhere between 30 and 50 degrees if you've had good antiversion in the cup and good antiversion in your stem. So that angle should be between 30 and 50 degrees in most cases. You may have to over-exaggerate this in some of the spinopelvic imbalance cases that I'll show you, but it's important to understand that this is a check and a balance intraoperatively, and it's a very useful tool to align your components. So again, let's kind of expand on this concept. Where do you put the cup? With one degree changes in pelvic tilt, there is about, uh, not a complete degree, but about 0.8 degrees change in acetabular antiversion. So as the pelvic tilt increases, there is an increase in acetabular antiversion and vice versa. With an increase in pelvic retroversion. Now again, pelvic retroversion, as you remember, is the sitting position where you get more of an outlet view. With pelvic retroversion, there is an increase in acetabular antiversion. With pelvic antiversion, there is a decrease in an acetabular antiversion, okay? Um, in a total hip without spinal deformity correction, the biggest problem is a high dislocation rate. So we have to be very cognizant of this in terms of our spinopelvic balance. This is the absolute key principle. So today, if you're going to walk away with anything in this talk, I think you have to understand the balance of the spine on the pelvis and the pelvis further down. And here is a beautiful slide illustrating this. Um, the spinal pelvic unit is fixed, but when the pelvis sits on something, it's the femoral head. And there are several degrees of rotation between the pelvis and the femoral head. So this, this unit, as you see here, is very mobile in multiple different planes and it is very unstable. 
So what is the principle that's important in this? Well, the principle is that if your spinopelvic unit is imbalanced, unfortunately, what is going to take bear the brunt of this is going to be your hip. So you'll have hip arthritis. Secondary to that, when you do a total hip in these patients, that implant is going to be stressed a lot more and the risk of polyethylene wear, uh, bearing surface failure and dislocation is very, very high. And it's because of this, the pelvis is rotating very freely around the femoral heads. Now, of course, there are muscles and capsular attachments that stabilize this, but overall, the least stable place is at the joint, which is the hip joint. So what's the treatment algorithm? Well, in some ways, uh, this is my treatment algorithm, but some of the literature is proving this to be a little old and a little too simplistic. And I'll go over this uh, further on. So if possible, you can get these films called the EOS films. Uh, it's a proprietary uh, software and a proprietary hardware uh, in which you get uh, sagittal standing and sitting spine films. And I'll show you some examples. And if possible, if there is spinopelvic imbalance, do a spine fusion and then put your hip in the uh, adequate position so that you're narrowing your zone of error, you're narrowing your margin of error on where, where to put the, the acetabular component. And there is a classification to understand spinopelvic balance or imbalance. So this is the example of this EOS system. It's a proprietary system uh, and it's pretty expensive, but some institutes have it. And you can get a very nice view of how the spinal column lines up with the pelvic uh, column and then how the lower extremity lines up and where the forces are uh, in this model. Now, what is the spine balance classification? It's very simple. It's a four by four, or sorry, a two by two Punnett square. Um, most of us will belong in the top left, which is we have a flexible and balanced spine. If we are not fortunate um, and we have to undergo spinal fusion procedures, especially spinal pelvic fusion, we would like to be in the top right, which is a rigid but balanced spine. Uh, if we have uh, adult spinal deformity, we mostly tend to be in a flexible and unbalanced spine. So in the bottom left, and from the bottom left, if we have to go somewhere, we really want to go to the top right. We want to be rigid and we want to be balanced. But sometimes uh, because of issues with intraoperative concerns or because of inadequate correction of the spinal deformity, we end up in the bottom right, which is the rigid unbalanced category, which is the most dangerous for these conditions. So again, we have looked at this before, what happens in the flexible yet balanced spine. You go from a standing position that looks like this to a sitting position that looks like that. So there is an increase in the pelvic tilt as you sit down. There is an increase in the pelvic retroversion as you sit down and your cup antiversion and your cup inclination tends to increase. But there is a low risk of impingement in these cases. Uh, if you put your total hip acetabular component between five and 25 degrees of antiversion. So this is the ideal circumstance for the hip surgeon. You can put the cup in Levanic safe zone and for the most part, you will be okay. What happens in a rigid but balanced spine? So now what is happening is that you have hardware up in the spine and you are fixing the lumbar column to the pelvis by means of uh, lumbosacral or, or a sacropelvic fixation. So now what happens is that depending on where you've been fixed and ideally you've been fixed with a lumbar low doses pelvic um, incidence mismatch of less than 11 degrees, this is not going to happen. You're not going to go from this position to this position as you go from standing to sitting. You're kind of fixed in this in-between position. So there is no compensatory increase in pelvic tilt. There is no compensatory increase in acetabular antiversion. There is no compensatory increase in pelvic retroversion. So if you are in this relatively neutral position for the acetabulum, when you sit, you will impinge anteriorly. And by impinging anteriorly, you will tend to lever out posteriorly. So in that situation, you have to, as a hip surgeon, give the acetabulum more antiversion. And this has been shown in this figure here, where in the extreme right picture, you see where the impingement occurs with the asterisk. And you would want to put the cup 
in greater antiversion. So about 15 to 25 degrees of antiversion so that you give them the most likely benefit of preventing anterior impingement and posterior dislocation. And you're also by giving them acetabular, you know, you're increasing the antiversion and I'm exaggerating in this case, you're also increasing posterior coverage for these patients. Now, what happens in a flexible, but an unbalanced spine? So in a flexible, but an unbalanced spine, most likely you are reducing your lumbar lordosis. You have flat back, okay? So in the flat back, uh, you know, your, your pelvic retroversion already exists. And to compensate for that pelvic retroversion, most patients will lean forward. So they will have a positive sagittal imbalance in their spine. Now, in that situation, when you are in a standing position, you will have fairly decent uh, acetabular antiversion because the pelvis is retroverted. But when you go in a sitting position, again, you will have increased antiversion, okay? The sitting position increased antiversion is okay, but in a standing position then, if you have increased antiversion, as shown here, the hip will impinge in extension as somebody stands and will lever out anteriorly. So again, I'm exaggerating the acetabular component positioning just to demonstrate this concept. So in that case, you want to reduce your acetabular antiversion and your cup will be more horizontal. But along with that, your cup will also have only five to 15 degrees of antiversion and not 10 to 25 degrees or the higher spectrum of antiversion. So to, to account for posterior impingement and to prevent anterior dislocation, what you are doing in that case is that you are artif artificially increasing your anterior coverage of the cup and reducing your posterior coverage so that you do not pop out the front. And ideally in this flexible and unbalanced situation, you should think about correcting the spine first so that you have a rigid balanced construct and then putting the acetabulum in a little bit more antiversion. Now, what if you have the worst problem possible, which is a rigid and an unbalanced spine? Well, this is what we call dealer's choice. Um, you know, typically you'll have to assess where the imbalance in the spine is. And in most cases, like I showed you in the lumbopelvic mismatch uh, X-ray, the, there is a flat back. So there is uh, inadequate restoration of the lumbar lordosis. If that happens, there tends to be a increase in posterior impingement and an anterior dislocation. So again, ideally in these cases, you should really consult with your spine surgeon and move them from a rigid unbalanced category or classification to a rigid balanced classification, and then put the acetabular component in increased version. But if they are reluctant or the patient is reluctant, then what you may need to do initially is put the acetabular component in less antiversion, so about five to 10 degrees or five to 15 degrees of antiversion to prevent posterior impingement. Uh, and then once the spine has been corrected, reassess the patient. And if they are presenting with instability of the hip, you may have to do an acetabular component revision, or you may have to end up with a face changing or a lipped liner to give it some more antiversion. So I wanted to demonstrate a case. Uh, this was a case uh, from fellowship in which we had a 53 year old woman who came with left hip pain and she had failed conservative management. She had some evidence of femoroacetabular impingement bilaterally and she'd had a prior arthroscopy with a labral repair, which had also failed. Uh, injections had failed. She had these comorbidities, but as you can see up north, she also had lumbar decompression and fusion. So we ended up doing a posterior lateral hip for her and, and uh, we had pretty good leg length correction, pretty good restoration of the offset. The acetabular component looked well placed, uh, but not enough uh, antiversion one could argue. Um, the night of surgery, she dropped something uh, from the bed and she tried picking it up. And since we had used Expiral in this uh, patient, which is liposomal bupivacaine, she ended up dislocating and not even knowing until rounds the next morning when we found her uh, with this hyperflexed uh, painful position uh, because the expiral had worn off. Uh, we then had to uh, perform this close reduction um, the same day for the patient. And we got some cross table lateral x-rays and I'm going to draw out the acetabular antiversion in this. So you go from the 
um, anterior and posterior margins of the acetabular component and then you draw a vertical line and you can see that we probably have about five or 10 degrees of acetabular antiversion. So not adequate in this case. The hip was still stable. Uh, we placed the patient in a knee mobilizer and an abduction pillow. She was made weight bearing as tolerated and physical therapy was resumed as normal. And she was discharged after a prolonged hospital stay and there were no further episodes of instability. But what should we have done ideally in this case? We should have gotten standing spine films to especially assess where her spine, her, her, uh, spine balance is because she did not have spinopelvic fusion. She had lumbar fusion, but that means that maybe her lumbar lordosis was not adequately restored. And all of a sudden she has this uh, rigid unbalanced spine or a flexible unbalanced spine. Um, and then we should have put the cup in a little bit more antiversion as I, as I showed you in that cross table lateral x-ray. Now, if she were to dislocate again, what would we have done? Well, number one, we could have consulted with our spine surgeons if her spinal balance was not adequately restored to correct that. We would have revised the cup to more antiversion. And once the cup is ingrown or used a multi-hole cup, we could have considered a constraint, but then you are increasing the risk of impingement by reducing the jump distance in these patients. So that is uh, not a good solution. Another option potential, potentially is to consider dual mobilities, but if a dual mobility dissociates, then it's no longer a closed reduction. You have to open the patient back up. So it, it's a complex interplay as I showed you previously. Now here is a, another example of this patient. So this is the best AP pelvis x-ray uh, AP pelvis x-ray for this patient I could get in a standing position. And you could see my template. So in this, you can argue that if this is an ideal AP pelvis, if you're looking at it, the patient is showing you more of an inlet. When they are showing you more of an inlet, what is happening is that they have lumbopelvic imbalance or they have uh, sacropelvic uh, imbalance. They have more pelvic antiversion. And as we know from our uh, prior discussion, if they have more pelvic antiversion, they tend to have native acetabular retroversion. So it, the acetabular version in relation to the pelvis is in a more retroverted position. Now, we, you can see that there is lumbar pathology in this patient. We counseled her. You know, I had a multidisciplinary consult with the uh, spine surgeons to see if she would like her spine corrected first. But given the lack of mobility with these severely arthritic inflammatory disease, uh, inflammatory arthritis uh, protrudes your hip, we elected to proceed with a total hip replacement first. So in that case, if I have increased pelvic antiversion to begin with, and I have relative um, acetabular retroversion, what I have to do is I have to exaggerate my acetabular antiversion because if the patient is going to be held in this position and they go from a standing position like this to a sitting position like this, they will impinge anteriorly and they will lever out posteriorly. So by increasing my acetabular antiversion, one, I'm providing a posterior buttress to prevent um, dislocation. And two, I'm reducing the risk of anterior impingement by allowing the hip to sit in a more favorable position. So these are the post-operative x-rays, as you can see on the left, where of course I had to restore the hip center of rotation by impaction bone grafting from the femoral head to bring the hip out more laterally. But you can see that the antiversion looks excessive and that's true. As you can see on this three-dimensional CT with the uh, cross section. Um, so here, if you put this cup the cup is way pointing towards the ceiling and not pointing towards the floor. So it is way antiverted to correct for this spinal pelvic imbalance in this patient. Now, of course, if she chooses to undergo the contralateral hip, we would do the same thing. Um, and if she chooses to undergo uh, spinal pelvic correction, then we may have to think if she dislocates anteriorly, but hopefully by that point, she has enough scar tissue to prevent that from happening. Now, this is a unique case of spinopelvic uh, imbalance. This was a 30-year-old woman I saw approximately two or three, year, three years ago. At that point, she was 30 years old. 
she came in with uh, 10 years of left sided groin pain. Uh, she was otherwise pretty healthy, but she had a surgery for uh, developmental dysplasia of the hip at age 15. And she, this was done in South America and we weren't sure what the procedure was and it was difficult for the patient to explain it, but she'd had failure of non-operative measures. Uh, she had severe limitations in range of motion of her left hip. Uh, there was a significant limb length discrepancy and of course an antalgic and shortened uh, adducted gait. And these are the preoperative radiographs of this patient. And again, you can see that there is something going on which I couldn't really understand besides the, uh, you know, there is of course a deformity in the proximal femur, there's a deformity in the left acetabulum, but there is something going on the spinal pelvic junction. And I will uh, describe that to you as we move along. But if you could imagine her left heavy pelvis is held in a very inlet type position and her right hemi pelvis is rotated a little bit in a normal AP pelvis position. So she has this uh, one-sided inlet view and an other sided, um, almost a neutral view of the AP pelvis. So there is something going on and it is lopsided. Uh, again, you see this here, uh, you can, you know, you would look at the hip deformity and you're like, yes, you know, of course that's a difficult deformity to correct. And probably the procedure she was referring to was a shelf osteotomy, osteotomy to correct her uh, developmental dysplasia. But look at the sacro-pelvic junction. You have a beautiful SI joint on the right side, but on the left side, it is very hazy and in fact, not even existent. So what did we do? We got a CT scan and ah, that reveals the true picture. On the left side, see, she has sacroiliac fusion. It's an auto fusion, either developmental uh, or something happened during the course of her treatment. And we just don't have previous x-rays to see what's going on. But on the right side, she does have a, a mobile uh, sacroiliac joint uh, to some degree. So this is something which is very challenging to address in addition to her lumbar lordosis. And this is a saddle view showing the same thing where her left-sided pelvis is, or hemi pelvis is fixed in this position and that's what we have to work with. Uh, once again, the CT scan showing that there is no SI joint on that left side. And you can see the deformity of the femoral head, which is, um, uh, you know, fallen into this uh, retroverted position in the proximal femur, uh, along with very less um, uh, virgin given to the native acetabulum. So what are some challenges to consider? Of course, the patient age and the further dictation of a bearing surface, the limb length discrepancy and counseling the patient that you know, to some degree, her limb length discrepancy will persist because it also involves an SI joint that is autofuse, which we cannot correct. And she probably she had a prior infection uh, along with her uh, her surgery, so we have to think that even if the labs are normal and if we find that the frozen section shows high PMNs per high power field, we may have to consider putting in a spacer in this patient. The anatomic challenges include, uh, in addition to spinal pelvic imbalance a sac uh, SI joint autofusion, pelvic dysmorphia. So where do you put the cup in such a challenging case? Dysplasia. So re we really want to keep that superior shelf. Otherwise our cup is going to escape superiorly. And then femoral retroversion. So think about this. We just spoke about um, pelvic antiversion, retroversion, acetabular antiversion, retroversion, but now there is femoral antiversion, retroversion that we need to consider. So how do you account for all these uh, complex things? Well, you know, again, for me, um, x-rays are fine and I, I could have gotten long length uh, spine films, but I don't think that that was very helpful in this case. I really wanted to focus on the CT scan. So I created a three-dimensional um, model uh, with a 3D printer of this uh, construct. And this is the posterior view, as you can see on the left-sided image and the superior view, as you can see in the right-sided image. Here is the shelf osteotomy, the shelf that I want to preserve. And here is the native femoral head. So I want to, um, you know, kind of use this in my, my case to try and preserve whatever anatomy I have and correct whatever deformities I have to correct. Now, this is an intraoperative view, again, from a posterior or lateral approach, where you see the um, Gelpi retractor on the right-hand side, that is towards the head of the patient, and my Chanli retractor is facing towards the foot of the patient. And you can see the shelf osteotomy, but look at the native acetabular version. So her acetabular version is in a lot of retroversion. We already saw that her femur was in a lot of retroversion. So if we put a hip in this position, she is of course gonna lever out the back. 
So in that situation, we accepted that we would have to over antivert the cup and we would have to change the version of the proximal femur, which can be difficult to do. But here are the post-operative uh, functional videos at two years. And of course, she has a limb length discrepancy, which was described to her. I said that, look, we could give you a shoe lift, but uh, she did not prefer to use a shoe lift. Uh, so you can see this is her, her uh, ambulatory ability. And this is the ability of her to sit in a squatting position and stand up with complete hip stability at two years. And let me show you the radiographs for this patient. As you can see, we've employed the use of the shelf. We've put in a um, um, 48 millimeter cup, so that gave us a 32 millimeter head. We used multiple screws because I was afraid of uh, the cup levering out at some point. Uh, we were able to restore the position of the hip center of rotation. We could not, of, of course, correct the leg length because of the SI joint autofusion, but we were able to change the femoral antiverge or the femoral retroversion by using an SROM type stem to give it some more antiversion even in the femur. And then using Ranawat's combined antiversion technique, we made sure that her combined antiversion happened to be around the 50 degree range between 30 to 50 degrees and not on the lower end of the spectrum to give us the correction that we desired. And that has worked really well for her for two years. And we were uh, very fortunate in publishing this with some of my colleagues. So, you know, was what I presented uh, very easy to understand? Um, unfortunately, I don't think so because I had to think like a spine surgeon, remember my days in residency as a spine um, a resident, and then apply uh, my total hip principles and, and kind of think about the various different versions that we need to account for. But there are people in the, in, uh, the orthopedic community that think that uh, this is still too simplistic, that there is another layer that we need to unravel. And as we progress, uh, that's what we need to kind of do. We need to unravel this as layers of an onion to see where things belong today. So this was an excellent uh, review performed by Michael Mont uh, about two years ago. Uh, so these are, you know, just I wanted to summarize the findings in his review. So what is the impact of adult spinal deformity or ASD on total hip outcomes. And he looked at this and, and in the English literature, there have been three studies published on this from 2000 to 2017. And the first two studies were in ankylosing spondylitis patients with adult spinal deformity, but also with hip pathology. And what happens in these cases is what they've said is that, you know, the ankylosing spondylitis patients tend to have a lot of pelvic retroversion because of pelvic retroversion, they are fixed in this sitting type pelvis and they have excessive acetabular antiversion and that creates complications. So the acetabular, uh, if you do a total hip in these ankylosing spondylitis patients and don't recognize this, they tend to have a lot of anterior dislocations and revisions for that. Um, also dislocators, the people who dislocate have this higher degree of pelvic incidence to lumbar lordosis mismatch. So more than 10 or 11 degrees. And it's important to recognize that in cases of adult spinal deformity. Now, what if you go ahead and correct that adult spinal deformity by performing osteotomies and fusions? What happens then uh, on total hip outcomes? So these are patients that have adult spinal deformity correction and then a total hip. I said that that is my preferred thinking that we should correct the spine first and then put the hip where it belongs in the pelvis, especially as I showed you that the balance between the spine and the pelvis, we can control to some degree, but between the pelvis and the hips is very, very mobile. And that's where the stress happens. So multiple studies in the uh, uh, 2014 to 2017 era have shown that um, by correcting the adult spinal deformity, um, by fixing them in a you know, less of a, a pelvic retroversion, but more of a pelvic antiversion position, you are reducing the acetabular antiversion and you're reducing the abduction. So again, as acetabular antiversion decreases, the horizontality of your acetabulum uh, increases. Um, and by doing this, um, you know, still by doing long segment fusions as shown by uh, Bedard in uh, 2016, you are still increasing the dislocation risk and there was only one paper that threw their, their uh, hat in the ring and said, no, you should, you should still correct the spine first. 
What about previous spinal fusion on total hip outcome? So now it wasn't necessarily a fusion done for spinal deformity. It may have been a fusion done for uh, a degenerative process or a herniated disc uh, and some form of instability. Again, in all these uh, studies, uh, what has been shown is that there is a higher risk of dislocation after you do a total hip in these spinal fusion patients because that lumbosacral uh, junction and the sacropelvic junction is too stiff. So the hip is seeing a lot of this force. And if you increase the levels of fusion, you have increased risk of dislocation. So what should we do? Should we do a spine, def spine deformity correction and a fusion in these patients? Or should we just leave them uh, in imbalance and perform a total hip? So what is now emerging as we think about this more is that there are muscles that play an important role, especially when you're talking about pelvic antiversion and retroversion. So in pelvic antiversion, if you have, and I should uh, demonstrate this to you with a hip, with a femur model, if you have pelvic antiversion like this, and that is fixed in a patient, they tend to have a hip flexion contracture. They tend to hold their pelvis in an inlet type view. They tend to have a flexion contracture or also an adduction contracture. And let me demonstrate that to you with this slide. So as the pelvic pelvis antiverts, there is a hip flexion deformity. As the pelvis retroverts, um, there is an extension deformity in this pelvis. So you can see that there is antiversion happening. The pelvis is fixed like this. Now, if in that case, you do a spinal fusion and you fuse the spine like this, your pelvis is also going to be fused in increased uh, antiversion and your cup is going to be um, retroverted. So then you would tend to exaggerate the antiversion of the cup. But instead of that, what if you did this? And this is the proposed algorithm. So you assess the patient. If they have hip osteoarthritis and an adult spinal deformity, look and see if they have a hip flexion contracture present. And you can do that very easily on the table. If they have a flexion contracture present, so you go on the left side of this algorithm, then what you do is you go ahead and you correct, you correct this hip flexion contracture by performing a total hip. So now instead of the pelvis being antiverted like this, you are putting the pelvis in a more mobile area, somewhere between retroversion and antiversion. So somewhere here. And then you look at the spine. If after correcting the hip and correcting the pelvis, your spine has compensated for it and gone from an imbalanced to a balanced spine, then you can just monitor it, just look at it. If it is still an unbalanced spine, then you send them for a spine surgery consult and you do a deformity correction with a potential for revising the cup in the future. But let's say you do not have a hip flexion contracture present. And that patient says that, you know, I have these 50-50 symptoms, but really I think that I have this radicular pain. Then what you want to do is you want to perform the spinal correction first, fig uh, figure out where the spine balance is. And if the hip becomes symptomatic, then do a total hip. And in that case, think of it as a rigid and balanced spine. So in a rigid and balanced spine, you are fixing it in relative pelvic antiversion and your acetabulum is going to be retroverted. So in that case, you go ahead and you put the cup in a higher degree of antiversion. Now, if they do not have a hip flexion contracture and they tell you that the hip is more symptomatic, in that case, again, perform a total hip put the cup in relative antiversion and tell the patient that you are at increased risk of total hip complications if that spine deformity progresses. So the new method of thinking is don't just willy-nilly fuse the spine first and then do a total hip. Assess the patient. You don't need any kind of complex long length films like the EOS films. Look at their hip, look at their flexion contracture, correct their flexion contracture as you perform a total hip and then look at their spine and come back and address the spine. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I know this is a complex topic, especially on a Sunday evening, but uh, thank you very much. This is the Johns Hopkins Hospital as it stands today. 
and I welcome you to come and visit us and come work with us and hopefully we can learn from you as well. And this is my contact information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sabia. That was a splendid lecture once again. And uh, it was very nice listening to you. It's a, of course, it's a very, very complex topic and it's only off last one, 10. There's a lot of discussion on this. Until then, it was just, you treat the spine first, isn't it? Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And you know, we are extending this concept a little bit more because if you think, if you have a loss of lumbar lordosis, you have a flat back, you have pelvic retroversion. To compensate for that, patients, uh, you know, lean forward, have positive spinal imbalance. Now, you know, we are only talking about the spinopelvic junction and the pelvic hip junction. But look below that, look at the knee. Now you have a knee flexion contracture developing as well. So this extends further down the spectrum. Even in the algorithm that you mentioned that you quoted with um, the Journal of Arthroplasty 2018 by Sultan, if you look at the four different options, for the first three say that you look, you treat the spine first and only in the absence of a hip flexion contracture and with the symptomatic hip, you address the hip first, isn't it? Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Uh, you know, I think what the, the, the principle that they are trying to highlight is that, you know, there are certain things that you can, you can uh, correct, obviously, with your total hip, but you really want to engage your spine surgery colleagues early because in a lot of these cases, that spiny, the spinopelvic imbalance can be more complex than just, you know, three, four levels of correction. And they may have to look at an entire picture of this patient and really counsel that patient that look, we can do this in a staged approach, but A, we may need to alter the surgical approach that we used for you, we use for you, especially as a hip surgeon. And B, we may need to uh, perform revisions for you to prevent failure of these prostheses. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that has come up is, uh, see, you showed an X-ray of a protrusio with a increased mm -hmm. pelvic antiwasher. Mm -hmm. Right, and in that particular view, we have it appears like a pelvic inlet view, mm -hmm. and those are the patients who are at risk for acetabular retroversion and posterior dislocation. Am I yep. right? Absolutely. And in those cases, and in those cases, you try to keep the cup anti-warden slightly. Right. The same thing applies vice versa. If you get an outlet view, you are having a risk of anterior dislocation, and you're going to keep the cup slightly posterior. Am I right? Absolutely correct. Okay, I think, so basically, we can just have an idea by looking at the pelvic AP radiograph, isn't it? Absolutely, and as hip surgeons, I think that's what we're inclined to do. Because you know what, as a hip surgeon, if you talk to them about pelvic incidence, sacral slope, and pelvic tear, they're not- very confusing. They may not be very comfortable, unless you're a spine surgeon. So I think a very useful tip is that pelvic radiograph, AP radiograph, if it is antiverted, <coughs> if it looks like a inlet view, risk of posterior dislocation, you keep the cup antiverted, right? Absolutely. And you know, even in those cases, what I would argue for is get a standing AP pelvis view. Always standing x-rays, weight-bearing x-rays, because sometimes when they lay down, things change completely for you. And then, you know, again, your references are gone. But when, and you have to recognize this, if they are laying, you know, they're obviously laying down on your operative table. And if you're doing an anterior approach, all of a sudden, if that pelvis goes into more retroversion and the acetabulum appears to be more antiverted, that can fool you. So you should recognize your standing x-rays and template off of those. And so, uh, with respect to that particular x-ray, Protrusio, where you have a pelvic inlet kind of view, what would you expect when you take an, uh, a supine and a, uh, sitting and a standing. Is, was that a standing or a sitting x-ray? That, that was a standing x-ray. And in that particular case, how, what would be the supine, I mean, sitting x-ray, how would it change? You know, um, and again, you know, part of this is observation. And I think that, you know, as we, as we examine patients, I like to have them sitting. I like, like to see them standing to see where they are. I don't have x-rays. I don't necessarily get EOS x-rays. But if they have a, uh, a, a balanced, uh, spine to some degree, you may have some change. So as you you know are going from here in a standing view, you may have some correction of that 
in a in a normal pelvis or a balanced uh, or a flexible spine but in her case given the amount of arthritis it was fixed in this position because as she was sitting she was lurched way up in the front like that so i think that that was important to recognize in her that you know if she's sitting like this and i do a posterior lateral approach she is going to go off the back okay i think and uh, see suppose in that particular case where we have a same salivary increased pelvic anteversion increased risk of acetabular lateral traversion and uh, posterior dislocation do you think if we approach it using an anterior hip surgery is going to have a benefit yes so you know uh, there is a lower risk of dislocation with an anterior base surgery you're not you know affecting the posterior capsules you're keeping that intact but there are two you know suggestions that i have for that um one you have to be facile you have to be comfortable doing an anterior hip if you do it very less you know then you risk uh, in uh, destabilizing the femur especially as you're doing the femoral release so you have to be very comfortable doing that um two is that you have to really position that patient carefully and keep assessing the position of the patient with the anterior approach if i am doing an anterior approach i tend to use a lot more x rays to keep confirming where the position of these components are because i do not have the ability to perform a complete range of motion analysis as i do with the posterior lateral approach so in my hands i still feel more comfortable assessing limb lengths offset combined antiversion anterior and posterior instability from a posterior lateral approach so in my hands i would still do a posterior lateral approach for that patient as i showed you and do you think a navigation would help in improving the accuracy reducing the risk of dislocation yes so that is fantastic if you you know um uh, i was you know i learned a little bit of computers growing up and there is this term called uh, gigo which is garbage in garbage out and the important thing with that is that if you use navigation be very careful about your pelvic referencing maybe get a ct scan maybe compare that maybe and you know you can take it as the next step forward you can use a mako or some kind of robotic system if you have access to it to really understand your your pelvis but if you don't have access to these um then i think that the ranawat combined antiversion trick is essential and if you learn that you will very rarely make a mistake in aligning your components and do you have a computer based uh, surgery at john hopkins for joint replacement for him so oh, yes so we do have a navigation system and we are in the process of uh, getting a robotic system okay the mako uh mako yes uh, but also the uh, smith and nephew has a robotic system called the navio um so they have a hip application and that's what we are looking at as well and uh, the other thing was i uh, you showed the coplanar test or the ramba ranawat combined antiversion test it was really nicely explained and is it the angle that the leg that's subtended with the horizontal is that the angle that you're talking about yes so the you know as you know as you i'm going to try and demonstrate this with this you know hip model so if i am like this my hip is reduced here okay uh and if my tibia fibula were attached to the knee in a posterior lateral approach what i would do is i would look at the angle that the tibia fibula make with the horizontal or hopefully the floor and that will be the angle which gives you the coplanar or combined antiversion angle and it should be within what i mean what is the normal range it should be yeah so that's between 30 degrees and 50 degrees so if you think let's say you put your acetabulum in about 15 degrees of antiversion and your femur in about 15 degrees of antiversion 15 plus 15 is 30 degrees of combined antiversion and let's say you go to the higher end of the spectrum you say that i have someone with lumbar pelvic imbalance uh, and i want to put them at 25 degrees of antiversion in the acetabulum and 25 degrees of antiversion in the femur as shown by that extreme case at the end then my combined antiversion should be 50 degrees so that's why the range is between 30 and 50 so in that case your once you made the uh, once you put the trials your leg should so the tibia should be at 55 degrees with the horizontal correct so if this is the tibia fibula my forearm uh, this is the floor that's the angle that i'm making there okay oh okay so uh, that's all the questions we have uh, because it's a really tough topic and i'm sure even i have to go through the lecture many times 
I, I, the very, very important uh, example that you quoted was the Protrusio, and that is one that I remember so clearly that uh, the concept of antiversion and the risk of, I mean, concept of pelvic antiversion, risk of acetabular retroversion, and then you look for an increased antiversion for the cup. I think that's a very, very important case example that you've shown. Absolutely. And I think, you know, as, as a trainee surgeon, I was very confused when I would go into a case and my consultant or my attending would say, what is the version? I'm like, well, the version of what? You know, the version of the pelvis, the acetabulum or the femur. Uh, so you really have to tie these concepts together and understand that one affects the other, affects the third. And I haven't even gone to the knee yet, but if we include the knee, that adds a layer of complexity to these cases. Uh, and it requires a lot of planning. And in some cases, some experience to deal with these challenging uh, patients. Okay, Sabia. So thank you so much for joining with us. And we look forward for more lectures because it has been fantastic. Your perspective uh, about joint replacement and the surgery in detail. I mean, it's going to be so enlightening for a global audience, I'm sure, because you're sitting at John Hopkins, John Hopkins here at the best center. I'm sure everyone is going to get the top class experience from your lecture. Thank you once again, and we look forward to more from your side. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you.